Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to SOAS. It's so nice to see many familiar faces, new ones, some students, colleagues. My name is Mariano Erichiello. I'm the Shapurji Palungi lecturer in Zoroastrianism here at SOAS and uh, executive director of the Shapurji Palungi Institute of Zoroastrian Studies, which I chair together with my colleague, Almut Hinze, uh, Zartoshti Brothers Professor of Zoroastrianism here at SOAS. Um, so I, I got an announcement to give before we start. If you have nut allergy, please do not have any dessert. <laughs> so after the talk of Alexandra, we will have a, a reception in, on the second floor. Uh, and uh, please, if you have allergy, do not approach sweets. Um, so we got 95 registered for today and many also online. So it's a big event. Congratulations, Alexandra. Uh, and today we are here to celebrate uh, our students. Alexandra Buller was uh, a PhD here at SOAS. Uh, she completed her doctoral studies, dissertation, and turned her dissertation into a book, which we are going the pleasure to see for the first time here at SOAS. Um, let me just extend my gratitude to our professional services team, uh, Jerry, Imogen, uh, who is the executive officer of the Institute. Uh, without them, we could not really uh, organize any event. So thank you very much, guys. Um, and let me introduce Alexandra, who is, yeah, please. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Mariano. Uh, thank you very much for your warm welcome. <laughs> I'm going to, to read your biography. Oh, thank you. So after completing a BA in theology at Oxford University, Alexandra Buller, Dr. Alexandra Buller, studied here at SOAS. Um, and she also taught courses about Zoroastrianism and Iranian history here with us. Uh, your PhD was supervised by Dr. Sarah Stewart, who I will introduce later. Uh, she will, she, very kindly accepted to act as a discussant after your presentation. Um, and she also worked on the impact of constitutional revolution in Iran on Zoroastrian uh, members of the Zoroastrian community in Iran. She currently works at King's College, London, and she also is an artist and um, is socially committed because it's part of the non-profit collective. It's not your birthday, but, <laughs> but what? <laughs> Um, so, the floor is yours, and good luck. Thank you, Mariano. Um, thank you very much for the very warm introduction, and thank you to everyone at the Shaburji Palonji Institute for Zoroastrian Studies for very kindly inviting me to have my book launch here at SOAS. Um, thank you to everyone who's helped with all the tech, to Imogen for all your help organising everything, and of course to Sarah to, for agreeing to be my discussant. Um, big thank you to my publishers, IB Taurus and Bloomsbury, and everyone who has supported me through this very long process, um, and who is here tonight and is watching online. Um, it's really special to be launching my book here at SAS uh, because as Mariana said, I studied here, did my MA and my PhD here, um, and my book developed from my PhD, which focused um, on Zoroastrians during the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1906 to 11. Um, and the book takes a bit of a, a broader perspective, looking at the years from the mid-19th century to the 1930s. Um, and this period was a period of major political change in Iran, so as well as the constitutional revolution in the early 20th century, which resulted in the establishment of a parliament, the Majlis. Um, there was also the end of the Qajar dynasty in 1925, when the Prime Minister Reza Khan established the Pahlavi dynasty and gave himself the position of Shah. And meanwhile, in India, there was British colonial rule, but the independence movement was gaining ground, with India gaining independence in 1947. Um, so let me just um, go to, OK, yeah, there we are. Um, so when I was researching the position of Zoroastrians um, in this period, I became particularly interested in looking at the relations between the Zoroastrian community in India and the Zoroastrian community in Iran. Um, and the significance of uh, references to the pre-Islamic past. 
Um, and connected to this, thinking about how Parsis, the Zoroastrian community of India, perceived their ties to Iran um, from where, according to tra tradition, they left in the 9th or 10th century. Um, so I'm interested not just in the religious and historical ties, but also about contemporary political and economic ties. Um, another issue I found really fascinating was the changing dynamic of relations between Zoroastrian communities in India and in Iran and the British, um, especially in view of British involvement, interference in Iranian affairs, um, and the largely close relations that the Parsis in India had with the British. Um, sorry, I'll just, so um, thinking about um, this idea of relations between Zoroastrians in India and Iran, Although there were previous links between the two communities, the mid-19th century um, was a period that was significant um, in terms of the impact that these relations had on Zoroastrians in Iran. Um, at this time, Zoroastrians in Iran were a marginalized community. They faced discrimination because of their religion, as did other groups who are not Shi Muslims. Um, and most Zoroastrians at this time were living in and around the towns of Yazd and Kerman. Um, in contrast, Parsis in India had um, prospered under British colonial rule, particularly as merchants and then industrialists, many living in Bombay, now Mumbai. Um, and so during the mid 19th century, concerns were raised in India about the situation of um, Zoroastrians in Iran. And this was pro prompted in part by the personal accounts given by Zoroastrians who had left Iran to find uh, better economic opportunities as well as greater safety in India, um, sometimes leaving to escape forced conversion to Islam. And in 1853, a group of Zoroastrians in India, Parsis, so Zoroastrians who'd been living in India for a long time, centuries, as well as more recent Zoroastrian immigrants from Iran and their families, founded a philanthropic organization, the Society for the Amelioration of the Conditions of the Zoroastrians in Persia, which is quite a mouthful, so I'll just refer to it as the Amelioration Society from now on. Um, and this organization aimed to support Zoroastrians in Iran and to encourage religious reform in the community, as well as to reverse the decrease in the number of Zoroastrians, the population figures, which was another concern. Um, and this organization sent an emissary to Iran, and the first emissary they sent in 1854 was Manakji Limji Hatariya. Um, and the money that was raised by the society was used in various ways, including the restoration of religious buildings, the payment of the jizya, which was a tax levied on non-Muslim communities. Um, Hataria had apparently wanted to travel to Iran for some time, um, and he was interested in the pre-Islamic past. So as well as his work um, helping Zoroastrian communities in some practical ways, he was also in touch, he corresponded with um, some individuals who have been described as early Iranian nationalists, such as um, uh, the Qajar prince in the far right-hand side, Jalal al-Din Mirza, and the playwright Mirza Fatali Afunzadeh. Um, and all three individuals viewed the pre-Islamic era as a kind of golden age. Um, and they hoped that with the, um, so that they'd be able to restore Iran's greatness by bringing things back to how, how things were before. Um, and Hataria was also keen to increase knowledge and interest of the pre-Islamic period amongst Parsis. So he encouraged research into texts, ancient texts. Um, and as well as being keen for Parsis to learn more about their heritage, he also recognized that there would be benefits for Zoroastrians in Iran if positive views of the pre-Islamic past were promoted. Um, because as I said, at that time, there was still a lot of discrimination on religious grounds. Um, so he forged links with European diplomats as well, and that put him in a good position to place pressure on the Shah to improve the condition of the Zoroastrian community. Um, and he wasn't the only Parsi who was involved in lobbying for change. Um, so there's a Parsi community in London as well. Um, and in 1873, the Qajar Shah Nasr al-Din Shah visited Europe for the first time. 
and he came to London, and here's a picture of him at the Royal Italian Opera, now the Royal Opera House. Um, and while he was in London, um, Zoroastrians met with him, which was a strategic move because the Shah was keen to present himself as a modern and reform-minded monarch. So um, the Parsis met with him and presented him with a petition signed by one and a half thousand individuals um, asking for better conditions for their co-religionists in Iran. And one of the Parsis who gave him this petition was Zedabai Nauroji, who was um, a prominent figure in Indian nationalism and then in 1892 became the first Asian member of parliament in London. Um, and as a result of Parsi lobbying in London and from India and um, in Iran, the jizya tax was abolished in 1882, and that was very significant as it decreased the economic burden on Zoroastrians in Iran. Um, another key achievement of the Amelioration Society was the establishment of Zoroastrian schools, first for boys and then later for girls. Um, and as well as Amelioration Society schools, um, British missionaries working in Iran for the Church Missionary Society founded a school for girls in Yazd in 1902, and this caused a bit of controversy at the time. Um, whereas the education of girls had been promoted within the Parsi community for some decades, um, our dish in, um, Zoroastrians in Iran were not wholly supportive of the idea, and um, Ardashir reporter who's over there. He was the third emissary sent by the Amelioration Society. There are records of him apparently arguing over this issue um, with Zoroastrian priests in Iran just at the time when the Church Missionary Society were trying to open their school for girls, which was 1902. Um, so I found that really interesting, looking at the Church Missionary Society archives and coming across these details. Um, as well as being encouraged by missionaries, um, the education of Iranian Zoroastrians was also supported by British officials who were working in Iran. Um, and I found it really fascinating to see how British geopolitical concerns, principally the threat of a Russian advance south towards India, um, affected interactions with Zoroastrians in Iran. Um, the British were very keen to capitalise on their good relations with Parsis in order to increase their influence by establishing strong relations with Zoroastrian community in Iran, um, a growing number of whom were engaged in trade. Um, and the argument was made that the Zoroastrians could become to the British what the Armenian community were to the Russians, so a loyal minority who could also help widen a trade network. Um, and Major Percy Sykes, who was the first British consul posted to Kerman in 1895, was really keen on this idea of promoting education and viewed the Zoroastrian community as having potential political significance. And he encouraged Zoroastrians to learn English. Um, and you might be able to see in the photograph, some of the boys have a round um, circle on them. Those are medals that were awarded to boys who were doing well in English or had been attending the school regularly. Um, and this was part of Major Sykes's plan to encourage everyone to learn English rather than Russian. Um, sorry, let me. Um, this is a picture of the um, consulate in the Kerman with Sykes then. I think it might, must be his sister on the other sort horse, Ella, who travelled to Iran with him. Um, and Zoroastrians sometimes took refuge in the grounds of this consul, consulate in Kerman, so they would be able to, I, I think, camp out in this garden um, and the British would offer some protection. Um, Sykes was also involved in the 1904 British commercial mission to southern Iran, um, which reported on key merchants and trade patterns, um, and intelligence was gathered from Zoroastrians. So Ardashir reporter was apparently very helpful, as were members of the Kerman Anjuman, which was like a Zoroastrian community organization. Um, and the members of the commercial mission described this Anjuman, the council, as the chamber of commerce of Kerman. Um, and there were interesting details like um, some of the merchants, Zoroastrian merchants, said, oh, Zoroastrians are starting to drink tea. That's going to become an important commodity. You should start importing tea to Iran. Um, and I'll just move on to my map. Um, one idea was to try and get 
Zoroastrians to be more involved in overland trade, going through Quetta and then Sistan. Um, and the idea of that was to strengthen border regions, again, to prevent Russian um, influence coming further south. Um, so, yes, lots of geopolitical factors shaping relations with Zoroastrians. Um, in terms of trade between India and Iran during the 19th century, the development of steamship production also led to an increase in the volume of sea trade, um, and that meant there were more Iranians living in Bombay, and the Iranians sent, sort of established a consulate there, and they had a, a consul general in the city. And from the 1880s, the Persian consul generals were clearly trying to establish good relations with the wealthy Parsis. They invited them to lots of fancy parties, um, and they appointed a few Parsis as vice, vice consuls. Um, they were also, quite a few Parsis were Freemasons, and then the Iranian consul generals also became Freemasons. So on lots of levels, they were socializing. Um, References were made by both sides to the glories of ancient Iran, and a Parsi playwright called Kehoshro Kabraji, who dramatized stories from the Shahnameh, stated that Parsi love for their homeland, meaning Iran, had previously been subdued but had found vent through contact with the consul general. Um, and in 1888, when one of the holders of the post, Hossein Khali Khan, left, for Iran, he promised that the Shah would strengthen links with Parsis, and this led to this idea that they would um, be given a plot of land and the Parsis would be invited to start a colony. Um, nothing really came of this, and then there was a satirical ar um, article in the newspaper making fun of the idea. Times of India took it seriously, published it in translation, um, but it was, um, didn't come to anything. Um, but the idea of a Parsi colony um, bordering or in Iran did re-emerge in 1905 and at that point it did seem to be taken a bit more seriously. Um, again, nothing came of it, uh, but it was discussed the year later in 1906-1907 during the early um, months of the Constitutional Revolution which was viewed as a major turning point for Zoroastrians um, in Iran. Um, late in 1906, Sykes was um, described how renewed attachment to the fatherland and a revival of interest in its affairs mark the special features of the past Parsi year. And another article in a journal called Men and Women of India praised Zoroastrians in Iran for tenaciously clinging to their ancient home, and it stated that they could now provide shelter to a large section of the Parsis of India now hemmed in on all sides by fearful competition. So there were worries about um, the future of the Parsi community in India in terms of their economic and political status. I um, just want to show, this is a cartoon from a Parsi journal to, called The Hindi Punch. It was The Parsi Punch, but then they changed their name to Hindi Punch. Um, and this image is, it takes a story from the Shah Ahmed, a Persian epic poem, and then... Um, uses it to ridicule the idea of a Parsi colony. So not all Parsis supported the idea or thought it was um, at all serious. Um, some did, some didn't. Um, so this is a story of a legendary king, um, Keikavus, who had a flying throne. And in this cartoon, on the king, it's, um, it's written the Parsi colony scheme. Um, and the king used four eagles who flew up because at the top of the poles there were four chunks of meat, so they flew high to try and get the meat. But then they got tired and the whole thing collapsed and all tumbled down. So um, that was the moral of the story. <laughs> it wasn't going to work. Um, so, yes, so the Parsi colony scheme was not, not taken seriously by everyone, but Parsis were questioning their future in India, particularly in terms of their economic and political influence. Um, and although a number of Parsis, uh, for example, Dada Bhai Naroji, who we saw on the slides before, um, were very much involved in Indian nationalist ac activities, others were worried that political re reform would result in them losing their privileged status. Um, and some said, you know, it was better for the community to steer clear of politics. Um, Nusaravanji Shariyarji Jinwala said, we're wanderers from fatherland, so it's not... Um, not our place to be involved in what's going on in Indian politics. Um, but whereas 
Parsis were worried that their political power was in decline. The Iranian constitutional revolution was perceived by the Parsi community as a major event with positive political implications for Zoroastrians. Um, and indeed, some Iranian Zoroastrians were actively involved in the constitutional revolution, particularly merchants. Um, and the revolution began as a protest by merchants and by members of the ulama, the Muslim religious class. Um, and it began sort of protests about economic conditions, foreign um, intervention in Iranian affairs, um, foreign loans that the Shah had taken, and they wanted to limit the power of the Shah, principally regarding economic matters. Um, but alongside financial concerns, there were these semi-secret societies, partly inspired by the recent revolution in Russia, um, and they played a role in spreading ideas about constitutionalism and reform. Um, and this is a major event that pushed the Shah to agree to giving the people a constitution. Um, this was Muzaffar al-Din Shah at the, this point in time. And this um, was when about 12,000 people or more took fast or kind of like a sit-in or a strike in the British legation grounds in Tehran. So this is a picture of all of the cauldrons where people were cooking food for 12,000 people who were camping out for about a month. So the whole, pretty much the Tehran Bazaar was on strike because people were camping out in the British legation. Um, and during this period, Ardashir reporter the emissary for the Amelioration Society, helped with the negotiations between the protesters and the British, and he also helped spread ideas about democracy, as did other members of these secret societies. Um, and financial support enabling people to go on strike for so long was given by a number of wealthy individuals, including a Zoroastrian merchant, Arbab Jamshid, amongst others. Um, and this is a picture of Arbab Jamshid, and there with some of um, the people who worked with him. He's sort of in the middle with a scarf. Um, and he was a very well-known merchant in Tehran at the time, and he'd built up a business trading textiles. He'd bought land um, that he used for cash crops, and his Jamshidian firm was really famous for money lending. Um, he helped support the Zoroastrian community in Tehran, and he had about 150 Zoro Zoroastrians who he employed, as well as hundreds of Muslims and members of other religious communities. Um, so when the first Majlis, the first parliament, convened in 1906, he was the only member who was not a Muslim, or at least nominally a Muslim. Um, so very unusual. He was allowed to be part of the Majlis. Um, and that was a major event for someone who wasn't Muslim to be part of the National Assembly. But even though this was perceived as being a significant event, um, which reignited discussions about possible returns to Iran amongst Parsis, um, it's not to say that Parsis sort of thought, oh, the Zoroastrians in Iran are now fine and there's no danger anymore. They still thought they could influence how Zoroastrians in Iran were treated um, and so when Muzaffar al-Din Shah died early in 1907, they wrote to express their condolences and their hope that the new Shah, Muhammad Ali Shah, who didn't have as good a reputation, they sort of expressed their hope that he'd continue to promote religious tolerance and uphold the constitution. So this is another cartoon from the Hindi Punch, and the baby is the Persian parliament. So as soon as it's sort of born, its father, the Shah, died. And this is the, the new Shah, Muhammad Ali Shah. Um, just when this was happening, early 1907, the Emir of Afghanistan was visiting India. And this is the image that was used to promote the book launch. Um, and some Parsis thought, oh, we want to have a special welcome for the Emir of Afghanistan. Um, and the Hindi punch um, had an article saying, some busybodies have made the discovery that the Parsis are more Afghans than Persians. And um, the caption underneath this is Dina saying to Gulcha, the Emir is coming, there'll be a reception at Government House, another opportunity of shining. And her friend says, or of cooling heels at the doorstop, there'll be such a crush. 
And Dina says, but we'll claim priority as Afghan Parsis. Um, so some Parsis were keen to use um, this as an opportunity perhaps to establish trade links with Afghanistan using ancient links to the country. Um, but others argued that it was important that they focused on the Zoroastrian community in Iran, saying that it would be injurious to Zoroastrians in Iran if they welcomed the Emir because of perhaps because of tension between Afghanistan and, and Iran at this time. In the end, there wasn't a separate welcome. Um, then request wasn't granted. Um, as well as this kind of direct influence the Parsis um, were believed to have on the position of Zoroastrians in Iran, they did use a sort of more indirect way of um, helping through the British. They put British, uh, pressure on the British to intervene to support Zoroastrians. Um, and similarly, the Zoroastrians in Iran, knowing that the British had these good relations with Parsis, used that to put pressure on the British as well. Um, and when I began my research, I came across an argument that um, the Anglo-Russian Convention of 1907 was a disaster for Zoroastrians. Um, and this was an agreement which had claimed to respect Iranian independence, but was drawn up without any Iranian input, um, and sort of divided Iran up into three portions, with a Russian zone at the top, a British sphere of influence at the bottom, and the middle was seen as a neutral zone. Um, and I read this argument that when this happened, the British, who had been in favour of the constitutionalists, stopped supporting Zoroastrians who um, this argument said we're also in favour of constitution, the constitution um, because the British didn't want to um, antagonise the Russians who supported the new Shah who quite quickly went against the constitution. Um, but although I did see kind of broad um, criticisms of the convention like this one, again from the Hindi punch, which shows the poor Persian cat being tugged in both directions, um, there was, I didn't come across any sort of specific criticism on the impact it would have on Zoroastrians. Um, and then when I sort of looked more carefully, um, I didn't, in the archives, I didn't see anything that sort of showed any great change in the relationship between the British and Zoroastrians. And I think perhaps it's because some of the places that um, Zoroastrians were living were still in the neutral zone, so British were still keen to... Um, maintain sort of influence in that area um, and I sort of this became clear when I compared the British reaction following the murder of two Zoroastrians in Iran Parviz Shah Jahan who was killed before the agreement was signed and Feridun who was killed afterwards um, and in both cases um, both men were prominent merchants and they were linked to the Jahanian um, firm another Zoroastrian trading firm um, in both cases, the British did put pressure on Iranian authorities and tried to support efforts being made by Zoroastrians to secure justice. Um, so, for example, they said there would be economic implications if there wasn't justice, if Zoroastrians weren't supported. Um, and in the archives, I found quite a few references to unofficial representations being made, which I feel is probably why it hasn't been noticed, because there isn't as much of a paper trail um, so it's not as obvious. Um, as well as um, being um, helping Zoroastrians because of the Parsi relations, the British also had their own trade relations, direct relations with Zoroastrians in Iran, which was another reason why they were interested to support the community. Um, efforts made by Zoroastrians to secure justice following these two murders were significant in legal terms. Um, Parviz, who was killed in 1907, quite soon after the initial constitution was signed, um, there were then supplementary laws which were being drawn up because the initial constitution had been signed very quickly um, and um, the constitutionists wanted to um, make some more detailed laws and add to them. And there were lots of debates over the issue of equality um, so some Muslim clerics who had initially supported the revolution then turned against the constitution, because, um, particularly because of a proposal that non-Muslims should be equal to Muslims in the terms of the state law. 
Um, and these clerics who turned against the constitution had the support of the new Shah, Muhammad Ali Shah, who was concerned that any supplementary laws would then limit his own power. Um, and Zoroastrians um, lobbied for equal rights and they made references to their ties to Iran, their ancient heritage. Um, they stated that if conditions improved, Parsi Zoroastrians in India might return with their wealth to Iran. Um, and the case of Parviz was mentioned in debates um, and in relation to the administration of justice, saying that um, crimes being committed against Zoroastrians need to be dealt with properly. Um, and after months of debate, the laws were passed with the inclusion of this very controversial Article 8, which stated that Iranians were equal under the law. Um, Feridun was murdered after these laws were passed, so there was then a lot of pressure from constitutionalists to actually implement the new laws. Um, and again, Zoroastrians threatened to leave Iran. There was reference to the economic impact that this might have. And in the end, the perpetrators who were supporters of the Shah were punished. And Sorur Fakil, Feridun's widow, was actively involved in the campaign, working together with constitutionalist organizations. Um, at this time, there was a lot of tension between the Shah and the constitutionalists. And in June 1908, he instigated a coup. Um, and the parliament, the Majlis building, was bombarded. Um, and this began a period of a year known as the Lesser Despotism. Um, and this period, when I was doing the research, it just was very complicated and confusing because in the provinces, there'd be um, the local rulers who might be on the Shah's side, but then they might change sides when it looked like the Shah was going to lose. And then I thought, well, the Zoroastrians are pro-constitution, but then it turned out they were happier with someone in authority in a local area rather than no one in authority. And then there were um, records of groups that said we're constitutionalists, but then they'd be um, telling communities, there was, they went to a town and told all the Jewish community that you've either got to convert to Islam or we'll kill you. So they weren't acting in constitutionalist ways. So it was quite a complex period to untangle. Um, so yes, it was um, tricky, that bit of research. Um, and this is um, another picture from the Hindi punch. After a year, the Shah was overthrown and he was replaced by his very young son, Ahmad Shah. And that um, led to Parliament being reconvened and the second majlis, um, so the second sitting of the Parliament. And again, Zoroastrians had a representative, Keiko Shroshakrok, who held this position until 1940. Um, and at this point, other um, recognised non-Muslim communities, so Christian communities and the Jewish community, had representatives in the Parliament as well. Um, so this is Shahrokh. And we've actually already seen him because he was the headmaster at the school in Kerman. Um, so before becoming the um, um, representative in the Majlis, he had been um, educated in, in India for a bit. He came back to Kerman, worked um, as the schoolmaster. He then went and worked for the Russians as an agent very briefly. He then went to work with Arbab Jamshid in Tehran. Um, and during the early part of the Constitutional Revolution, he was campaigning for the inclusion of Article 8 in the Constitution, um, and he wrote articles for a constitutionalist paper, um, Nadaya Vatan. He was a Freemason and also involved in Zoroastrian community affairs, uh, presiding over the Tehran Anjuman, the community organisation, um, for many years as well. Um, when he was in the Majlis, he emphasised that he represented the whole nation, not just his religious community. But when there were cases of Zoroastrians um, being discriminated against, he did intervene. Um, so with the re-establishment of the constitution and constitutive parliament, Zoroastrians in India saw this um, as another turning point and reconsidered their involvement in Iran um, and at this point, they were encouraged a lot by Iranians who hoped that Parsis might offer financial support, might feel patriotism towards Iran and um, offer their financial support um, to the Majlis. So, including the Persian minister in London, Mirza Mehdi Khan. And this, um, more pictures from Hindi Punch. This one here shows 
two ghosts at the top. Um, and the first one is the ghost of Nasser al-Din Shah, who had abolished the jizya tax. Um, and he's speaking to the ghost of Yazdegerd III, who was the last Zoroastrian king of the Sasanian Empire. And he says, Nasr al-Din Shah says to Yazdegerd, oh, the Parsis are thinking of helping Iran. And Yazdegerd replies, yes, the love of country still burns bright as in the past. May your children and mine work hand in hand and shoulder in shoulder for the peace and betterment of our ancient land. And may Iran rise to its former glory and power through their joint peaceful cooperation. And underneath there's a caption saying that Parsis were being encouraged to look into potential commercial and industrial opportunities in Iran. Um, and this, um, it also claimed that there were posts available for them in various Persian government departments, revenue, customs, post, police, open to Parsi applicants. Um, so there was some enthusiasm for further involvement in Iran, but this um, decreased in 1911 with Russian aggression and the Russians sort of came in from northern Iran towards Tehran and this led to the dissolution of the second majlis and that's what the, um, the cartoon at the end is showing the snake the boa constrictor is Russia um, attacking the Persian cat um, so Zoroastrians in India did try and petition the British government to support the constitution but without any success so there was a temporary suspension of constitutional rule at that point. Um, but despite that, Zoroastrians in India did continue to regard the revolution as having been a positive turning point for their co-religionists in Iran. There were reports of changing attitudes towards Zoroastrians, um, with Zoroastrians being seen as pure Iranians and people having greater respect for their religion. Um, even in, I think it was 1913, references to some Muslims wanting to embrace the Zoroastrian faith. Um, the Majlis was later... Ooh, no, that's not the right one. Sorry. <laughs> um, the Majlis was later reinstated... Um, in 1914 for the coronation of Ahmad Shah and then again after the First World War ended. And not long after that, in 1921, a military officer, Reza Khan, launched a coup um, and he pushed the Shah to form a new government. Reza Khan became the commander of the army. He then soon rose to the position of prime minister and by 1925, the Majlis had voted to to depose Ahmad Shah, end the Qajar dynasty, and Reza Khan took his own place as Shah, creating his own dynasty, the Pahlavi dynasty. Um, and to legitimize his new dynasty, he was very critical of his predecessors. Um, the Qajars were um, described as being Turkish tribe, not pure Iranians. There was a push towards secularization and modernization, and the state promoted a form of nationalism that looked back to the pre-Islamic past when Zoroastrianism was the dominant religion. Um, and at this time, there were clear links between the Pahlavi state and Zoroastrians in India. So there were Parsis visiting Iran as tourists, also going um, to check out potential trade opportunities. Um, and in 1922, the Iran League was established in India, and that was... Um, established by Zoroastrians who wanted to strengthen relations between India and Iran um, and also to help um, raise the socio-economic position of Iranian Zoroastrians. Um, and they promoted cultural as, as well as economic ties. And one of the cultural events that they were involved with was the Ferdowsi celebrations in 1934. Um, and that marked a thousand years since the birth of Ferdowsi. And um, Sharok played a key role in Iran, and Zoroastrians in India sent a statue, and a film was made as well but about Ferdowsi's life. Um, and that was a, made in Bombay, and it was a collaboration. The production company was owned by an Iranian Zoroastrian, um, and there was an Iranian, Abdul Hussein Sepanta, who wasn't a Zoroastrian but had changed his name to make it sound more Zoroastrian, which was criticized by some Parsis. Um, so that's the film poster from that. Um, 
But with better conditions in Iran and greater secularization, Parsis, um, although they had a reputation for philanthropy, they began to argue that sending money to support projects in Iran, especially when they wouldn't solely benefit members of their own religious community, um, they said that perhaps they should focus on uh, supporting people in India instead. Um, and one um, key project where this sort of became clear was the idea that Parsis should... Um, donate towards a girls' school in Tehran, and rumours went around that it would mainly be attended by Muslim girls, and Sharok and reporter were trying to get Parsi support, but there wasn't um, a huge amount of enthusiasm, um, and Parsi said, well, our own community is now not doing so well economically, there's more unemployment. Um, in the end, a Parsi woman, Ratan Baitata, did give funds. And here is um, a picture of the opening ceremony with Sharok opening the school. Um, but there were critics, and the argument was sort of made that funds ought to be directed to the Parsi's real home, which was now described as being India. Um, so India now on the cusp of independence. Um, and now Iran, rather being than being described as the fatherland as it had been, a few decades before was now a foreign land. Um, so a lot sort of changed from the mid 19th century when the Amelioration Society was founded um, in terms of the broader political situation in both India and Iran and the position of the Zoroastrian communities in both places. And this also impacted the dynamics of relations between the two communities. Um, so I haven't, obviously I haven't been able to cover everything in my book, but um, I hope that's given a bit of an overview into some of the themes I address, looking at the Zoroastrian communities in the context of the broader political situation, um, the significance of the links between the two communities, um, how Iran was perceived sometimes as a place of opportunity, sometimes as a homeland, um, and also the impact that British relations with Parsis had on Iranians or Astrians who could also use this to their advantage. Um, so thank you everyone for listening. Um, oh, and I should say, um, for people watching online, if in case you want to buy the book, there is a discount with that, but no, <laughs> no obligation to buy the book. Thank you so much for this fantastic journey into religion, politics, trade, philanthropic identity of Zoroastrians in Iran and, and India. Um, I really look forward to reading the book. And I think, I'm sure it's going to be a great contribution for the study of modern Zoroastrianism. And on this note, I would like to invite on stage an influential scholar of modern Zoroastrianism, Dr. Sarah Stewart, emeritus reader at SOAS, so she plays at home. Um, Sara is the first Shapurji Palunji lecturer in Zoroastrianism and director of the Shapurji Palunji Institute here at SOAS. Um, it's difficult to summarize her profile because she did many things, but um, has conducted extensive field work in Iran and uh, her research informs one of her latest publication projects, which is um, Voices from Zoroastrian uh, Iran in two volumes, substantial work. Um, she recently led a um, Gen Z and Beyond uh, survey, which is a global survey on, on Zoroastrians in the world, um, and is currently working on the edition of the Zoroastrian World, which we all look forward to reading. And which you've contributed to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Um, do you have a microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations, what a wonderful achievement. Um, Thank this you. is a, this is a ooh, this is a, an exciting day. And uh, yeah, I thought um, when we when I came in, one of one of your uh, one of your guests said to me, You must be so proud of your former student, and indeed I am. So I wanted to say thank you and thank you for involving me and also I think people think, well, if once you've completed your thesis, um, with a bit of tweaking, you have a book. So, you know, it's not such a, a big undertaking, but actually it's <laughs> probably just the very first step. Publishers have different ideas about what they want to do with your thesis. 
and it's actually been the beginning, it was the beginning of a very long journey. Um, so I, I thought I'd begin by asking you, when you were carrying out your research, both for the thesis and for the book, what did you find most interesting? I mean, we've seen what obviously has been a very interesting overview of all the elements in the book, but what did you, what did you really enjoy about the research? Oh, what did I enjoy about the research? I loved finding connections. So when I'd see, um, let's say, an individual mentioned who had connections to India, Iran, and sometimes London as well, and just putting together different types of sources and seeing how sort of one person or a theme could be connected. So there was um, a, a Zoroastrian living in London who was publishing a sort of Banji Manikji Cooper, and he would, he's in London, born in Bombay, and then he'd be, um, his newspaper would be translated, articles would be translated, would reappear in Persian newspapers during the Constitutional Revolution, and then um, elements from talks he gave would be reported in India. So I loved finding those connections. I found that really exciting. And just, I also really enjoyed the archival, sort of going to the archives, going through all of these endless bits of paper and then coming across something, think, oh, that's exciting. That's something that maybe someone hasn't seen for a long time or just little <laughs> references to, um, as one that always stays in my mind when, um, a report of Zoroastrian girls who are, there was just, they were being forcibly converted to Islam and one girl acted in doing nonsensical things and she was let go and it just stayed in my mind. But sort of details like that, so I really enjoyed. Yes, I can appreciate that and we have such rich resources here and of course you were in India as well. Um, so dare I ask, what were the particular challenges particular challenge the whole book <laughs> the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> no surely not well I do remember when we started out um, actually your focus all your field work was going to be in Iran yes and then there was an abrupt change um, really just as you began I was I had so got the visa I got I was everything. almost ready to go and then for political reasons at the time it was decided it wasn't a wise move. wasn't a good idea no. so you had to completely Refocus. Mumbai instead, which, I mean, yes, at the time that was quite a stressful sudden U-turn, but it did turn out, I think, perhaps if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have realised how interesting the links between the Parsis and what was going on in Iran. Perhaps I wouldn't have looked at that so much. So maybe in the end it was a good challenge, but it was at yeah. the time. I don't think I appreciated it. Well, I think, yeah, you mentioned the interweaving of... Uh, all these different aspects, but predominantly Iran and India. I think that's one of the key strengths of your book. Um, there has been some work on, on modern Zoroastrianism, but nothing like as much as the focus on the ancient world and texts and language. Um, but I don't think anybody's taken your approach. So India, Iran, but also the British, the role of the British and the Russians. So. It was a very, it's a very complex, complex to put it all together. Yeah. Um, so looking into the book more, um, you know, the specifics, you've mentioned, um, well, a common, uh, a theme that ties the Zoroastrians in Iran with Parsis in India is their shared um, history, pre-Islamic history. And um, so I wondered uh, to what extent you felt um, that uh, engagement affected their views on, on nationalism because your book covers an interesting em emerging nationalisms in the region. And so this shared identity, shared legacy, what do you think, how do you think that affected their respective mm. views on nationalism? I think, let's start with, well, in Iran, I think... Um, Zoroastrians engaged with individuals who were sort of looking back to the pre-Islamic past. And that was also from the mid-19th century, also the Constitutional Revolution. Um, they would be referring to their pre-Islamic history as a way of saying, we do have a right to be part of the nation. We are Iranian nationals. Um, but at that time, perhaps there were other sort of forms of nationalism. It wasn't so much focused on the pre-Islamic past. Um, but then with 
sort of increasing sort of animosity against the British that you see, especially after the First World War as well, the Anglo-Persian agreement that sort of fell flat but created a lot of anger. Um, you see more and more references to the pre-Islamic past and this sort of rise in nationalism looking back. Um, so yes, yeah, so then Zoroastrians were involved and Sharok was promoting that as well and involved with Reza Shah and the change in the calendar, the different names for the months. Um, but um, so, what was I going to say? I lost my train. <laughs> so we run and then, and and then, then India, India, in, yes. So in India, um, I think, well, some Parsis were a bit reticent about being involved in Indian nationalism and would think, sort of <coughs> reference their ties to Iran as a way of saying we're not Indian nationals, so this isn't our, we're not, we don't have to be involved, we shouldn't, it's not our place to be involved. And there was criticism of this within the Parsi community with some individuals saying, this is ridiculous, you've been living here for a thousand years, of course you're Indian. But then others would say, no, no, we're wanderers from a fatherland. Um, so, and that was linked to relations with the British and not wanting to um, jeopardise yeah. those ties at that point. Yes, you made that. You made. I think you made that point somewhere in the book that, um, um, of course, from the Parsi's point of view, they were um, through being protégés of the British. They were. They became more affluent. They became much more involved in the global economy, if you like. Um, than their Iranian counterparts. Mm. So I suppose this was perhaps a tactic. Yeah, um, but then interesting also in Iran, there was sort of encouragement from Iranians saying, you know, you should be involved in Iranian, the Iranian nation, you are Iranian, come and bring your money, you know, subscribe to our national bank, um, come and set up businesses here. So it's an interesting... <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you've got these two ideas, all over, albeit at different times, um, of uh, Iranians moving stock and barrel to to India um, and then the idea of the idea of um, uh, a Parsi colony in Iran yes. and uh, so it, that was an outcome was it of this whole idea of of, the, of this nationalistic um, view to go back to the motherland to resettle in Iran yes I mean linked to economic concerns um, as well Mm. The, with the Parsi colony plan. And then the British were also trying to push that because they were very keen for the Parsis. The idea would be to, for them to have some land just in the region that the British were worried about Russian incursion sort of oh, coming okay. south. So it would be convenient on many levels. That was the <laughs> thought. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting because you mentioned um, uh, it feeds into British geopolitical concerns and relations with Russia. Um, so do you think that in influenced or impacted, had an impact on potential British support for that plan to go to? Definitely, yes, because there are sort of references to um, various British officials who were posted in that region, and they were saying, yes, yes, we definitely give the Parsis land if they wanted some, or, and there were these concerns that the Russians were going to come south, mm. sort of mm. Baluchistan, and then come down. Um, and were increasing their influence in that area. And that also played into, I mean, the, with the education, the Russians sent books to the school, Zoroastrian school in Kerman and a couple of maps. And then the British started increasing their sort of educational um, thing. And then with trade as well, there was sort of um, a lot of competition. Good. Well, I think, I think perhaps we should open the floor, Mariana, to questions from the audience. So... Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, we have a question from Melbourne. If someone can... Ah, thank you, Imogen. Uh, thank you so much for your research and for your outcome. Uh, I'm a Zoroastrian from Iran, and I can confirm that everything that you said is totally accurate, oh. <laughs> right to the point. <laughs> and, uh, That's a relief, it. thank you. It has been documented by SWAS. A uh, couple of quick questions. One is when we talk about Iran at that time was much larger than Iran today. So it had part of Afghanistan, even Tajikistan. Yeah. So uh, today, 
we don't have many in Afghanistan, but we have a large community in Tajikistan, so that can be a future uh, study relationship with other nations. Now, when you talk about Mr. Reporter, there were actually two reporters, yes. uh, the father and the son, uh, Shapurji and uh, I think Ardashir. And uh, they were more political, and they kind of disguised themselves, and they're helping Iranians or Russians, in my opinion. So they were helping the British uh, plants in Iran, which I think was unfortunate. So I want you comment on it. And then the second question related to that, most of these heads of the Russians were in what you call Framosion, and uh, I want to know how that affected the relationship. They were what? Framosion. Fra Freemason. Freemasons. 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 Okay, yes, that's, that's very interesting. So yes, they were a lot of the, so Shah Rukh was a Freemason, one of the founding members of the first Masonic um, lodge in Iran. Um, and that would have helped with relations with other leading politicians, influential individuals. Um, and then as well in India, the Masonic links, I think, were important because the Parsis, a lot of Parsis were Freemasons. Um, and then when the Iranian council generals were appointed in Bombay, they also joined lodges. So I think those links were important. Um, and also the, with the Masonic ideas, they looked back. They also elevated the pre-Islamic past and had a lot of respect for um, Zoroaster. And they looked back to that period. Um, and the idea of brotherhood and um, promoting those ideals. Um, in terms of the two reporters, I, I haven't covered... I think the first Ardashir reporter was... Yes, he was involved with the British, but he was also helping Zoroastrians. He was doing a lot of different things. He was teaching at um, um, one of the colleges in Tehran. His son, I haven't researched, I have to say. Um, I know that there's one, there is a theory that Ardashir reporter helped um, with Reza Khan's coup, um, but I'm not sure, I wrote, I was, I haven't done that research myself, but someone else um, has looked into that and said maybe it wasn't so much that he helped with the coup, but he may have introduced Reza Khan to the British um, Ironside who helped um, support the coup. But thank you. Something else to look at later, perhaps. <laughs> Well, I was one of the ones lucky enough to read your PhD here at SOAS, and I was expecting tonight to hear a book which was largely based on that PhD, but I'm absolutely astonished <laughs> by the extent to which you have extended it, both back and forth, and the new material that you've had to master. So many congratulations on that, and I look forward to reading the book. Uh, I'm also intrigued about the linguistic challenges that this research must have presented. I, I know you're a great linguist, you speak modern Greek, for example, fluently, but you must have had to work in many languages. Whether it, Russian was one of those languages, I suspect not. Sadly but, not, but sadly Could you not. just recap which languages you had to work in to do this? So, yes, I mean, I did learn some Persian, and that was the... Uh, most a lot of sources were in Persian, and then a lot of sources were in English, including the ones from India. I did then have some help with some Gujarati sources. Sadly, I didn't use Russian sources. I did use some French sources as well, which included translations of some Persian manuscripts I couldn't find the original of. So Persian, French, English, and then I had help with Gujarati. But yes, there's lots more research to be done um, for people who do know Russian, or you know, there would be more to be done. Um, but yes, it is the challenge, the linguistic challenge was, was, <laughs> was there. We may have space for a last question. Mm, yes. Thank you very much for your presentation and for sharing your research with us. Um, I'm curious to know if in your research you found any evidence or trends that suggests that there are modern trends of a resurgence of um, Zoroastrian nationalism or any 
sense of um, Zoroastrian patriotism in Iran or in surrounding regions? Goodness, that's a very interesting question. I'm afraid I don't, I don't really, I haven't looked into that that much. I mean, I would, yes, there are, but I don't know exactly how it, it's something I should look into more. Sarah, do you have any, anything um, you, <laughs> sorry, I'm passing my no, question no, on. No, not really. I think that they're very hampered, Zoroastrians in Iran. So um, anything other than supporting um, the Islamic Republic um, to hark back to, although in Iran uh, there's still pride in a lot of aspects of ancient Iran, of course, um, but as Zoroastrians it would be difficult to be anything other than um, part of the current situation, current political um, scene. That, that would be my thought. I don't know. Sorry for not being able to answer answer your question. Uh, I would like to close with a question from Zoom. Okay. Um, hello, Alexandra. Michael Salzberg here from Bergen. Goodness. <laughs> Hi, Michael. Congratulations. I'm looking forward to reading your book. You mentioned that you enjoyed working in the archives. Which ones were most fertile ground for your research? And second question, will you continue your research to look at the post Pahlavi period? So... Is an invitation laugh, to work Sarah. with him, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question, I think, um, picking up on the point about the linguistic challenges, I have to admit it was easier for me to research English language archives. Um, and I did find the Church Missionary Society archives in Birmingham very interesting because there was a diary which was sort of handwritten and I really enjoyed being able to go through that and seeing it felt very close. But also the National Archives at Kew, um, just because there were weekly reports from the consuls in Kerman, weekly reports from Yazd, so all of the places where there were large Zoroastrian communities um, there were all of these weekly updates, so there'd be reports on things which might be easily lost otherwise, um, and quite a lot of detail, particularly because the British were worried about the Zoroastrian community and about maintaining those relations. Um, so I think both for linguistic reasons and because of what was there, those were probably the most, um, for me, but if someone else had different sort of languages, there would be other archives that you know, I'm sure would... Um, produce lots of interesting material. In terms of further research, not right now, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, maybe one day, <laughs> maybe one day. <laughs> you are warning uh, colleagues. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be interesting, it would be very interesting, um, but not for me right now. <laughs> this book was hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> On this note, I would like to thank Alexandra, thank, thank you, you so much, much, and congratulations you, for your book. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us today. And I would like to repeat an announcement, because now we are going, I would like to invite everybody to a reception on the second floor. I, suppose that our student ambassador with this violet, uh, he will guide us together with Imogen. Um, and I saw people coming a bit later. We have an announcement for those who have allergy, do not eat sweets <laughs> because there's nuts into dessert. Uh, feel free to have all the other things. And uh, thank you for coming and we will continue the conversation on second floor.